On the eighth day of October, Halloween gave to me eight scientists sneaking, seven gold ones shooting, six psychic scamming, five naked witches, four alien spelunking, three UFO abductions, two deputy so and so's, and a masked hawk being creepy. <laughs> Hey everyone, welcome back to the 31 Days of Halloween. I am Bo, your host for these uh, spooky goings on. And I don't know why I keep making the uh, introduction even more of a tongue twister. It's bad enough that there's so many of them. But I'm also using a lot of alliteration, which on a literary level uh, satisfies me on a level of I've got to say these things relatively quickly. Uh, it creates a lot of editing. At some point, I'll just do a master cut of all the times that I screwed up the introduction, and uh, and you guys can enjoy that. But anyway, hey, we are ending our look at Blumhouse movies today. Uh, this is the grand finale of that run before we jump into uh, some more classic scares. And in a way, this is sort of a bridge, right? That The Invisible Man is a remake of a classic movie, even though we're not doing The Invisible Man if you uh, listen to The Dark Parade. We talked about that uh, earlier this year. And the, I love The Invisible Man. I think it's one of the best of the, the universal monster films, one of the early films. Uh, I think Claude Rains is incredible in it. I think it's kind of mean-spirited and has a pretty big body count for a movie like that. So I love it. I, I, I think the original Invisible Man is is terrific. If you've never seen it, you should absolutely watch it. It's, it's better than you think it is. And the effects are still pretty impressive. So that brings us to this version of it, which is directed by Lee Whannell. Um, it, it stars Elizabeth Moss. And even though there are other people in this movie, like this is her movie because so much of it, you know, it, it rests on her shoulders, right? So um, Elizabeth Moss uh, plays a woman who is uh, in an abusive relationship with an inventor and she's terrified of the guy and so ends up constructing at the beginning of the film um, this, uh, this scheme to kind of get out from under his thumb. And the way that she is going to do that is, uh, you know, she's going to carefully choreograph uh, the, you know, the, where the cameras are uh, in this house watching her. Um, she drugs him so that she has some time. She's got to sneak around the dog, all that kind of stuff. And it's, um, like a, a really tense scene and made more so by the fact that, you know, obviously all does not go well and you see the violence that she's been living with. And, uh, then you come to find out, like, she goes to uh, stay with a friend of hers and, um, you know, her sister is there to kind of help her out as well. And then the news comes that her husband has has killed himself, that, you know, he couldn't kind of stand the pain of, of living without her and that she's going to inherit all of, all of his money and uh, the, the condition being that she cannot... Uh, you know, be arrested. She can't be a felon and inherit this money. But otherwise, you know, she's going to be incredibly wealthy and, and, and will be so for the rest of her life. And, you know, of course, this being a movie called The Invisible Man, pretty soon after uh, she gets this news that, hey, she's going to inherit all this money, um, weird stuff starts happening. And uh, she starts to believe that her husband may not be dead. And, you know, finds, uh, you know, like a, a cell phone from him and, um, you know, uh, like it gets to the extreme of people are getting struck in her presence and she is getting blamed for it, uh, up to and including a murder, quite frankly. And so what the movie does that that's very smart is I, I don't think you can totally remove this film from the time in which it was made. Uh, it you know, this came out in 2020 and this is sort of the height of the me too movement and, and this sort of third wave of feminism where 
women are starting to say not only are equal, but uh, you know we need to we need to be heard. We need to be believed when it comes to um, you know reports of domestic abuse and spousal abuse and um, you know the, the sexual assault and so forth. And that's what kind of elevates the, the Invisible Man into something a little bit more than just a remake of a horror movie. Um, it, you know, th this is a movie that's very much making a political statement, but the thing that is most impressive about the invisible man is yes, that is a hundred percent. The theme of this movie is that Elizabeth Moss is a character who is fighting against a system that doesn't really believe her, her own the friends and family don't believe her. And so she ends up uh, having to fight this on her own in a lot of ways, even though she is ultimately, you know, thrown in a mental institution uh, because she believes that her husband is alive, that her statement when, when a murder occurs is that, oh, no, no, I didn't do that. It was my husband who is now invisible making this happen. And they're like, oh, yeah, okay, lady. Well, we need to look at you through a hole for a while and, and see what's, what the hell's wrong with you. Even though, you know, there is this overarching and undeniable theme in the movie, it's also really, really good. It, it, the, the action sequences, there's a scene in, in said mental institution where Elizabeth Moss is being kept, where she ends up busting out, and it, it, there's this hallway scene, much like uh, something like Old Boy, only it's an invisible dude fighting a bunch of, of guards and stuff, and it's really good. It's really, really good. It's one of those things that when you when you see it in action, you're like, man, Lee Wanell is a legitimately good director. And, uh, you know, you can argue his writing skills at times, but he also wrote this. And this, I think, is a tremendous piece of work. And so that's the real trick of Invisible Man, right? Is that not only is it a good movie. Uh, and, and a movie with something to say, but it remains like super entertaining and really thrilling and, and totally a movie that is, uh, of its time, but, but there is an, a sadly timeless quality to what it is saying, uh, about the way that women who have been in these kinds of relationships, uh, find themselves cornered and, and put in a place where, no one believes them. Everything is set up to sort of side with, with the man, especially a very wealthy white man in this situation. Um, and you know, she, she ends up in a place where it's like, I got to do what I got to do. And, and she does. And it, that is really good too. It like the payoff of this movie is incredibly satisfying as well. And ends in a really morally great place where you're not really sure if Elizabeth Moss is the good guy you thought she was. And if not, if the situation has created her to be a, a sort of monster in this situation, because there was no other outlet and, and it raises some interesting questions and it becomes a movie that's, that makes you engage with it on not just the entertainment level, which is really high. As I said, this is a, a super entertaining movie. But it also is engaging you on a very intellectual and, and sort of sociopolitical level where you can avoid thinking about these issues. But I think Lee Winnell is very much hoping that you will engage with it in that place of thinking about Elizabeth Moss's character and what steps could have been taken so that she would have been believed. And you know, and of course her husband goes out of his way to make sure that the people who would ordinarily be her support system are, are taken out or put in a position where they can't believe her. And you know, that is a pattern of those abusive relationships. Like, you know, leave the invisible man suit aside, which I think is pretty cool once you get to see it, but leaving that aside that, you know, that, that is the, the nature of those relationships of, of, uh, the abuser trying to isolate uh, the abused member of the relationship so that they, they have to depend on them, that there is no choice, that they have to stay. And and ultimately, that's kind of the, you know, what, what our villain, in quotes, of the movie wants is he just wants that control restored. He wants her back. And 
it, it's it's harrowing because you know the the nature of the abuser does not change in the course of the film that he continues to be uh, a monster and and not because he's been made crazy by some formula but because he's a run of the mill ordinary dude and but a dude who is an abuser and um and I think that's really the the smart trick of this movie is that you're not seeing this you know scientist driven mad by his experiment but just a bad guy who is given the ability to be bad in a way that uh you know it, it terrorizes and uh drives this woman to the brink of of madness and in into a place that she would not go on her own um you know she is not a violent person by nature but by based on everything we see in the movie but by the end of the film like she is doing some shit that you know she it, it, again, it begs the question of like, is she doing this heroically? But if you look at Alice Hodges' reaction to what he believes she has done, it's more of a like, I, I guess you did what you had to do, but that doesn't make it okay. And that's a really interesting way to leave the character in in this movie. Uh, I really, really like it, and it does beg the question though: Is this the best Blumhouse movie? Because this is a movie that has, you know, an Oscar caliber performance and uh, with Elizabeth Moss and it has a, a theme that makes a lot of sense. It's really entertaining. Like, it's a terrific movie. And I don't really know if there's a better Blumhouse movie. There, there are movies, I'm sure, that are scarier, but in terms of just better, I don't know. I really think this is the strongest entry in the Blumhouse catalog. Um, it, I, like I said, for all those reasons, for the good performances and the, the really fun effects and the, the fact that it's entertaining, it's two hours long and it doesn't really sag anywhere in the movie. It, it just hums right along and has some really fun, shocking moments of like, Oh my God, I can't believe that just happened. Uh, and, and you feel for Elizabeth Moss and you know, you're rooting for her. And, but also you see her just completely losing her shit at a certain point. And it's, it, it's really great. This is a terrific, terrific movie. So, um, maybe not as, as scary as some on this list, uh, not as, as pulse pounding, although it is thrilling, but if, if we're going to talk Blumhouse movies, we can't not talk about the invisible man. And it's one of the reasons I left it, uh, for the end because it is so damn good. Uh, and it, it's deserving of sort of a special place to talk about what a terrific movie it is. And, um, you know, it, it, again, we, we have been blessed, uh, of late. We live in a renaissance of horror movies where you not only get the kind of fun schlocky stuff, uh, that, you know, uh, is, is sort of red meat for the horror fans, uh, inside all of us, but there are these kind of heady, uh, you know, theme driven horror movies that are more about the human experience and trying to use horror as allegory. And, you know, I, I just couldn't be happier. It's so fun to live in a world where you can watch, you know, this very year, you can see something like men that is very much an exploration of, of, you know, toxic masculinity from Alex Garland. And in the same year you get orphan first kill, which is this ridiculous schlocky movie and the fact that both of them can sit alongside one another and both be wonderful films uh, is it, it makes me so happy. I just I love being a horror fan these days and it's because of movies like The Invisible Man and and others that you know it at the risk of using a term that people seems to, to really shrink from but it has elevated the genre into not just a genre for horror fans that are looking for a good gore fest, but it, it has made the genre undeniable in terms of being a legitimate means of discussing modern society and modern mores. And that's all I want. You know, that's what I want. Sometimes, sometimes you want cereal, uh, for, for dinner. And sometimes you want a big steak and the invisible man is that steak. And, uh, uh, it, it is substantive, it is intelligent, it is, it is a thrilling watch, 
Uh, I just, I can't say enough good things about The Invisible Man. So if you've never seen it, by all means, you ought to. Uh, and if you have, do what I did, which is go back and revisit it this Halloween, and I think you're going to find uh, that it's as good as you, you remember it. Um, so that'll do it for our run of Blumhouse movies. I hope you've enjoyed this entry point into our 31 days of Halloween. We've got more stuff to come. Uh, I think tomorrow we're going to certainly dive into some classics with one that I had not seen in some time and really had a blast with. Uh, if you are listening to this on the Legion podcast feed, I encourage you to check out the dark parade, which is uh, the show that I do on the weekly. And you can find that wherever you find podcasts. Uh, and if you're listening on the Dark Parade feed, be sure you're subscribing to the, uh, the, the Legion podcast feed. So that will do it for this time around. Uh, thanks as always for joining me. Uh, we've got a lot more to come. Have a great Saturday. It is the weekend. It's the, the first full weekend of, uh, of October. So let's get into it. And I will talk to everyone tomorrow. Be spooky out there. Be spooky out there.